The feel it in your bones punch and kinetic energy of combat has always been one of Diablo's strongest attributes and Immortal proudly continues that tradition. It also looks set to continue the tradition of near never-ending gameplay, in which the meaty campaign is just a starting point, giving way to dungeons to run, higher difficulty levels to ascend, and end game systems to take part in. My verdict on whether it succeeds on all those fronts will be some time coming however, as the early access review build I've spent the last week playing was really only a taster in the grand scheme of what Immortal contains. After all, it's hard to judge a game with MMO aspirations amongst a small pool of players and an impending progression wipe ahead of launch. Even so, playing a Demon Hunter up to level 50 has done a great job of scratching my demon slaying itch, so stay a while and listen to what I think so far. This is sanctuary. To protect it, you must cross many lands. Somewhat to my surprise, I'm a big fan of the touch controls. What Diablo Immortal's virtual buttons lack in tactility, they make up for in versatility. You have the ability to easily move your character and aim skills separately, twin stick shooter style. It's certainly not as precise as using a mouse and keyboard, but suits the PvE gameplay really well, but the macro strategy is more important than the micro. My Demon Hunter for instance almost always had one skill for AoE, one for raw damage output, one for crowd control, and one for evasion, which combined to let me comfortably dominate most combat encounters on normal difficulty. Another nice touch is that the main attack auto-targets, meaning you can back away or change position while still attacking. The model also supports controllers and it feels good this way, with the right thumbstick used for aiming alongside the shoulder buttons for skills. Navigating menus is a little clunkier with the controller as you might expect, and overall the touch controls are seamless enough that touch is currently my preferred control method, particularly on iPad where the screen is large enough that having my thumbs on the sides isn't much of an issue. Mouse and keyboard is also supported on the PC, but I didn't have access to that version ahead of launch so haven't tested this yet. This is going to sound contradictory, but while character progression in Diablo Immortal is more multifaceted than any previous game in the series, I've never actually spent less time in my inventory in a Diablo game. Immortal boils down every item's power level to a single number, making it a gratifyingly simple matter to equip stronger items and get back to the killing. Longer term, you may want to pay more attention to what's dropping, particularly when you have a specific build you're aiming for, but in the early going, this dumbed down system puts the focus on the action, which I like. Salvaging unwanted gear has a very direct benefit in Immortal 2, as the scrap materials and enchanted dust you get is used to rank up your items. And you never lose that rank because you can simply transfer it across when you swap a new item in. This system means that not only is all loot useful, no matter how apparently useless, but alongside leveling up and gem socketing, it feels like I'm always making progress on my character. Speaking of gem socketing, Diablo Immortal has a major twist on that age old idea, legendary gems, which can be attached to your character's six primary items and can also be ranked up. These can have some pretty strong effects such as summoning shadow clones, inflicting agony on critical hits and preventing fatal damage. There are more than 30, opening up all sorts of options to hone in even further on a specific build. Legendary items themselves come with an inscription that modifies a skill, sometimes drastically, potentially encouraging you to shift up your combat strategy. In practice so far, I've actually found that it feels more restrictive, as strong inscriptions leave me reluctant to move away from a skill when I unlock a new one that serves a similar purpose. After all, why wouldn't I stick with Strafe for my AoE attack if I have an inscription that boosts its damage and one that extends its channel time? That said, I do like the ability to extract inscriptions and imbue them to stronger items of the same type. As for how all these character progression and itemization systems tie into endgame gameplay and also into monetization remains to be seen. Remember, all microtransactions were disabled on the version I've been playing, so I've really only scratched the surface after 20 hours played. And of course, there are five other classes to cut a swathe across Sanctuary with too. Similarly, I've only had a small sample of what the boss fights might be like once the difficulty cranks up, and there are some encouraging signs. Some bosses have bullet hell-like projectile attacks to evade, others transform or multiply. As you'd expect, many of these foes tower over the player, but the clear signposting ensures that you can see attacks coming. It is done. It will also be interesting to see how the Immortals vs Shadows conceit plays out too, 
The basic idea is that one group of players on a server hold power as immortals, and the Shadows, a much larger group that's broken up into sub-guilds called Dark Clans, attempt to gain enough momentum to overthrow them. There are numerous activities to compete in and perks to earn as part of this system, but again, with so few players in the early access period, I was only able to dip a toe in. That said, the early access period has been a valuable opportunity to see what the free-to-play experience is like. The good news is that not once in more than 20 hours did I hit any kind of unexpected roadblock where it felt like I was expected to make a purchase to more easily push through. Of course, in a modern Diablo, working through the campaign on normal difficulty isn't meant to be hard. It's meant to be fun and empowering, an excuse to show off your character's badass abilities and enjoy the rhythm of combat before you're tested in the fires of the harder difficulties. Even so, it's great that Immortal's business model doesn't mess with that, and in fact, it nails the sense of progression. The regular level dings, the steady evolution of gear, and the ever-expanding set of skills to use. And by the time I was getting a good feel for a zone, I'd be whisked to the next one. Well, for the most part, the first 10 hours set a breakneck pace, but after that I generally needed to grind to hit the recommended level once I'd unlocked a new zone. I didn't mind that too much, as the model gives you plenty of different options to earn XP. From taking on bounties and contracts, through to running short standalone gauntlets like challenge rifts, which steadily increase in difficulty, and elder rifts, which keep things interesting through randomised gameplay modifiers that can be both positive and negative. Even just roaming the world can be worthwhile due to the random events that pop up regularly, while hidden lairs can be discovered and conquered. The key thing here is that there's no need to put any money in to make steady, rewarding progress in the campaign, and that's a fantastic sign. Turn back. There is no need for you to die. A model feels great to play, and for the most part, it looks pretty good too. The character and monster models don't stand up to close scrutiny all that well, but from the typical gameplay vantage point, the art direction is strong enough to make up for low poly models and a lack of texture detail. A model is very much driven by mood and atmosphere, and in that respect it's captivating, transporting us from fetid swamps and foreboding woods, through moody caves, blood-smeared dungeons, and on to picturesque peaks. The many beasties look fantastic in motion too, even if they're largely cannon fodder for my explosive bolts. In the tradition of Diablo's recent history, the storytelling has been mixed so far, with voice acting that tends towards the overblown at times, I hate to see the pot boil over. And missions that are quite obviously just an excuse to send us on fetch and kill quests. Talk to Paulie, the blacksmith, and bring me what he's got finished. Let me guess, Asmir sent you. <laughs> he knows I can see him, yeah? Even so, Diablo 2 fans will dig that this game takes place after Lord of Destruction, with shards of the Shattered World Stone causing havoc all over Sanctuary, and there's a good sense of momentum throughout. I also appreciate how smoothly the main quest line incorporates the many dungeons. On a technical level, I encountered numerous issues with the pre-launch build, from bugged map, skill and dungeon screens, through to missing audio in cutscenes and dialogue, and even the odd crash. I'm sure a fair number of these will be resolved by launch, but I'll be surprised if we don't see at least a few pop up in the early days. I've only just started on my Diablo Immortal journey, but I like what I've played so far. The combat feels potent and weighty, with plenty of skill options for building out rounded and fun combat approaches. The story moves along at a brisk pace, opening up new zones steadily, while the many character progression systems ensure that I felt like I was always making progress and growing more powerful. I could practically burst out into song! And with more than 20 hours of microtransaction-free gameplay behind me, there's clearly a lot of content to enjoy before you need to consider spending money. So this is very much a game you can try before you buy. Of course, it's too early to say whether that's too good to be true for the end game as well, which is why I'm not yet comfortable slapping down a provisional score here. That kind of thing can cast a dark pall over even a great game. Stay tuned for my full review in the coming weeks after launch on June 2nd. For more on Diablo-inspired games, check out our thoughts on the early access versions of V Rising and Achilles Legends Untold. And for everything else, you're in the right place. IGN.